Hi guys, welcome back to another Hugh Jeffries video. In this video, we're going to be repairing three iPod minis that are in various condition. Of the three, two have dead hard drives. Yes, these tiny MP3 players have mechanical hard drives. I still don't know how they can fit one in there, but we'll have to see when we open them up. Along with cosmetic issues, all of these units are also still running on their now weak original batteries. Sold between February 2004 and September of 2005, the iPod mini lineup has only two models, which can be seen here. One is a first gen, with the other two being second generation models. Only minor changes were made between the two revisions. Testing each iPod, I can examine their condition. The blue second gen has a dead hard drive, same goes for the first generation silver model. The last iPod appears to work fine. To get these iPods back in superb order, they'll all be receiving an upgrade to 32GB of flash storage using a compact flash card, along with a new 600mAh battery. It's now time to open up the first iPod mini. With no visible screws, the only way inside involves prying. Both the top and bottom plastic pieces will need to come out. Some adhesive holds them in place, but it's no match to my Jimmy Tool and plastic picks. After creating a gap, a few plastic picks can be worked around to separate the pieces. If you're following along at home with your own iPod, it's important to note this piece only attaches one way. Under the plastic is a metal retaining bracket that is secured by clipping into the edges using four tabs. Thankfully, there is holes that can be used to unlatch it, however the left side is directly above the click wheel's fragile flex cable. I found that just wiggling the left side out after freeing the right avoided any damage to that cable. The cable itself is connected firmly and is prone to breaking off, so I was sure to gently lift it up from both sides. At the top, I'll need to repeat the same process as the bottom plastic piece by inserting a jimmy tool and working the plastic pick around the edges. Removing the top section reveals two Phillips head screws that will need to be unfastened before we can remove the internals of this iPod mini. Sliding the internals out, we can finally get a good look at how this iPod mini is constructed. I can only assume the chip with the music note printed on it is the main processor. The internal construction is similar to other iPods of the time, only everything is much smaller, even including its hard drive. On the back of the unit, we'll disconnect the original battery from the iPod mini before detaching what Hitachi is calling the micro drive, which is another word for a very tiny hard drive. Not only are we going to be replacing it, but I'm going to take a closer look at the micro drive itself and disassemble it to see what it looks like inside. After all, this one doesn't work anyway. With the rubber bumper removed, next to come off is the flex cable that interfaces with the logic board. This can simply be wiggled out of place and put aside. To get a closer look inside the drive itself, I'll need to remove the outer sticker to reveal the hidden screws below. These screws are all tri-wing, which are pretty common nowadays in products like the iPhone. With them all removed, I can lift up on this metal cover and reveal the insides of the drive. It does look like a scaled down hard drive. When you compare it against a desktop drive, you can see the major size difference. This micro drive is absolutely miniature, measuring in at only 42 by 35 millimeters. With a miniature drive comes miniature capacity. Throughout their production, they were available in capacities from 170 megabytes to 16 gigabytes. One advantage to micro drive is that it shares the same size and interface as compact flash. This is the reason why I've purchased compact flash cards as they'll be a direct replacement and a more reliable storage solution when compared to the original. The only downside to a compact flash card is their absurd price. Each of the 32GB cards cost me a whopping $54. With the flex cable connected, I'll reinstall the rubber bumper. 
While this isn't necessary with a flash based card, it will stop it rattling around inside the casing. After the flash card is connected, the new battery needs to go in. These replacement battery cables are too short, which required them to be tightly bent on the battery side in order for the cable to reach the socket. I'll clean off the LCD using a microfiber cloth to remove any of the dust before reinstalling it into the casing. With it in, we can now reconnect the flex cable for the click wheel and connect the iPod to a computer. In its current state, the iPod shows up as a removable 32GB USB drive. However, in iTunes, we can restore the iPod, which will reinstall the operating system onto the drive. After it's loaded the files, we can connect it to a power adapter for the installation to begin. After a few short seconds, we're back up and running into an operating system and this iPod mini now has 32 gigabytes of storage. After fastening the two Phillips screws at the top, the plastic piece can be reattached. The residual adhesive was strong enough that it could be reused. At the bottom, the metal retaining clip can be reattached. This was almost as challenging as getting it off as I needed to find a way of properly reattaching it without damaging the cable below. Yet again, I started with the right hand side and after it was attached, the left side went in a lot easier. As for the plastic piece, it needed new adhesive applied. After scraping away the old glue, new strips could be applied before the piece is reattached to the iPod. Firmly pressing it down back into place, this completes the first iPod. With one down, there's two to go. The blue one is in the worst condition of the three, with several dents and a cracked plastic lens. Whilst replacing the battery and hard drive with a compact flash card, I'll also attempt to fix some of the device's cosmetic issues. Despite the large dent on the front, it still slid out of the casing with relative ease. Internally, this iPod looks like it's taken a few trips to the beach. I'll need to clean out any of that sand whilst reassembling. For now though, I'll take out the battery and the micro drive, which we'll both replace. Again, I'll remove the rubber bumpers and the flex cable, which will all transfer to our compact flash card. Back over at the logic board, I'll clean off all of that sand with a brush. With that, our iPod is ready for reassembly. I'll connect our flash card into place and the new battery. With the internals ready to go, it's time to fix some of those cosmetic issues. I'll try to bend back the frame as best I can at this lower section. Up at the display, things proved more difficult. Given the small amount of clearance, I wasn't able to remove the dent below the display. Next, I wanted to try and remove the crack to the plastic. Replacement casings are hard to find, so I decided on trying a windshield repair kit to fill the crack. I poured it on and cured it using the UV light, but the crack is still visible. I scraped away the excess glue, which took quite a long time as it was really stuck to the aluminium. However, comparing the before and after, the crack is a lot less noticeable, so it has slightly improved it. With the cosmetic stuff repaired as best I can, it's time to reassemble the iPod mini. Sliding the internals back into the iPod mini, I can fasten the two Phillips head screws and connect the one flex cable for the click wheel. Proceeding, I can install that pesky metal retaining clip. After cleaning both pieces, the top and bottom sections can be reattached to the device.
The last thing left to do with this second iPod is to install the software onto our new compact flash card. It's time for the last iPod, our second generation silver model. For those wondering, the second generation came with color matching text on the click wheel, an additional 6GB model, and a larger battery. Another giveaway is the addition of the storage being printed on the back, which is absent from the first generation. Internally, they look similar, however the logic board has a few minor differences, including the click wheel connector being different between the first and second generation. Pulling out the 4GB Seagate drive, this one actually functions, so I'll be putting it aside and keeping it as a spare, just in case I ever need it. But for the sake of reliability, I'll be replacing it with a compact flash card, just like the other two units. With the new battery installed, everything can be put back together. The last thing I'll do before installing the plastic pieces is to test out the unit, make sure we can install an operating system, and the iPod itself is functioning. With the other two working perfectly fine, I don't see why this one would fail. Although, I was proven wrong, as the click wheel now didn't function. At a closer inspection, I noticed that I had damaged the connector in the removal process. These are very easy to damage, as you're literally prying up on the solder joints of the connector itself. After touching up the solder joints, it's now functioning again as it should. With that, I can now install the plastic piece up at the top, the retaining piece of metal down at the bottom section, and finally the plastic cover going over the dock connector. With the iPod's internals revitalized, it's time for the outside to look the same. I will thoroughly clean all of the devices using an alcohol wipe. Given these devices were saved from a recycling center, it's unknown what kind of grime they have been exposed to. After everything's cleaned down, we're done. So this is it, three iPod minis. What were all broken and covered in grime have been saved from a recycling center and resurrected back into working condition. One cleaned up nicely and is cosmetically flawless, but the other two have minor marks that doesn't affect the functionality. I'm amazed that I was so easily able to swap a dead mechanical hard drive out with something that I can still buy off the shelf over 17 years on. That's repairability I like to see. And on that note, this has been a Hugh Jeffries video. If you like what you saw, hit that subscribe button and consider checking out the MP3 playlist for more videos just like this one. And if you're looking for any used devices, be sure to check out my online store, link for which is down in the description. That's all for this video, and I'll catch you guys next time.